Welcome to Technado with Don Pizzette. Featuring Sys Admin Expert, Don Pizzette. DevOps Engineer, Justin Dennison. Security Specialist, Daniel Lowry. And Peter. Hello and welcome to Technado with Don Pizzette. I'm your host, Peter Van Rysdam. We've got the whole crew here today. Don, how you doing up there? I am doing great. Excited about today's podcast. We've got a great guest lined up. Yeah, we have a great guest. We've also got a, a lot of great news. A lot of like data just seemed to get lost this week or, <laughs> or is manually thrown away. So we'll definitely talk about that. We've got uh, Justin over there. Justin, how's it going? Going fairly well. Uh, you know, it's uh, and, and I'm sure Peter would say something about it. Different hair day today if you're watching. Yeah, I appreciate if you're not, the honesty. It's the exact same hair as all the other times. I appreciate the honesty of fairly well, and not yeah. not not great. Uh, Daniel, how's it going up there? Uh, I'm doing uh, fairly well as well. I'm I'm concerned that Justin's going to violate his parole, but <laughs> I, I think he'll I think he'll get through it this time. I think he'll make it to the end. Yeah, I'm trying to get out of my motorcycle club, but they <laughs> are relentless. And Daniel hasn't had a hair day in as long as I've known him. Yeah. I don't believe, but. Uh, all right. Well, let's uh, let's go ahead and jump over to our guest now, who's joining us all the way uh, from Athens, and not the Athens, the redneck Athens in, in America and Georgia, but the, the <laughs> real one uh, <laughs> over in Greece. We've got Costa uh, Sausis, who is the CEO of NetData. How you doing, Costa? Hi. How are you? I am fine. I'm fine. Thank you. Uh, we are great. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. I know uh, it's always fun with the the time difference and all that, but uh, we appreciate you. Uh, you taking the time, and and we definitely want to uh, want to learn a little bit about you and learn more about net data. So let's go ahead and jump in to our first segment here, which is rapid fire questions. Who do you work for? What's new? Who are you? What's happening? What's wrong with you? All right, Costa. This is a five minute segment. You have forty five seconds to a minute to answer each one of the questions you go over. Peter's going to hit the buzzer, and we're going to move on. Peter's going to take our first question. All right, so it says on, on your bio, and I'm going to quote here, it says, uh, the company was born out of, quote, the frustrations you experienced as an employee with limited visibility into the operational issues of your employer's network. So I know we're going to dig into that a little bit deeper uh, in, the, in the next segment, but can you tell us uh, a little bit about um, what you created with, with NetData? Yes, of course. So NetData, NetData was never intended to be a monitoring tool. Uh, I created the data mainly to replace the system console for troubleshooting. So I, I needed a tool that will allow my engineers to use this tool instead of digging around into the hundreds or thousands of the tools of the console. So I needed a tool to, to, to provide, to, to, to digest unlimited number of metrics with the same granularity as the console, so per second, every second. Uh, with zero configuration, no preparation at all, and immediate results. So you just install it and use it. And of course, to provide meaningful presentation, meaning that the tool should be able to present all the metrics, all the, inform the information in a meaningful way, so that uh, our engineers can explore the infrastructure and understand the technology. Now, I know with your product, there's a lot of projects out there, open source projects that will launch and some of them will go a step further and like hire a marketing team to promote them. They'll do giant releases. You released yours by announcing on Reddit. Uh, and I know Reddit is like one of the top five websites in the world. A lot of people go there. How did that launch go? Well, uh, it was amazing. Of course, this, this happened uh, long before the, I formed a company around the day. So I was building the tool for a couple of years. It was ready. Uh, I used it to troubleshoot a really a lot of problems and uh, it really provided a lot of visibility that no other tool could provide. And then one, one day I decided to, to promote it. I tried to, to, to push it with, via articles, blogs and the likes, but no one was interested. So one day I decided to post it on Reddit and it went viral. It went amazingly uh, uh, virally, so so in in two weeks it got ten thousand GitHub stars. It's probably the most uh, the, the fastest project that got ten ten thousand GitHub stars. Huh? Uh, it stayed at the top trending GitHub projects for all languages for two consecutive months. It still is for the C language, and uh, of course it appeared all over the place. So it immediately was at the uh, homepage of Hacker News, at, uh, you know, all over the social media, Twitter, Facebook, everywhere. 
So I thought that uh, Reddit was a very nice move at the end. Huh? So you just said it's for the C language. That begs the question from my perspective. Like, why did you mm -hmm. choose C to, to create this project? Is it just a familiarity thing, or did C have features that maybe like Python, Go, uh, some of those other languages that are a little faster growing? Or C's been around, it's probably always going to be around, but in comparison to those languages. So the idea is that, okay, you have this tool, and this tool is supposed to run on all servers, everywhere, on all VMs, all containers, everywhere. So the first thing you, you understand is that this will, will run side by side with some production systems. And you need these applications to behave extremely well. Right? You need to control every resource utilization it, uh, it consumes. So how, which is the best language to do that? So the best language to do it is C. Of course, the data today has a plugin architecture and it allows you so it, it even today has plugins in Go, in Python, in Node, in Java. So all the languages are supported. But the core, uh, the thing that controls every, and orchestrates everything is in C, mainly because uh, we can control precisely the resource utilization it has. Costa, I also see that you're involved with the uh, Fire HOL uh, project, built as the firewall for humans. What can you tell us about that? So open source is a miracle. Eh? It's, it's one, I consider open source as one of the breakthroughs of our time. It changed my career, uh, and uh, I think it influences the world significantly. So uh, throughout my career, I tried to give back to open source. Uh, I, I did this uh, quite a few times. Uh, at the same time, I enjoy uh, balancing, you know, excellence and uh, efficiency. I, I try to help people be more e efficient, more effective in what they do. This is what Fire, Fire HO World does too. It, it is about two tools. Uh, one is a firewall configurator, uh, and the other is uh, a quality of service configurator. So, so the idea is that you use these tools to configure very complex firewalls uh, without losing control or your mind. <laughs> in <the> way. <laughs> how, how do you have time for all this is my question because uh, I mean, not only did you create uh, NetData when you were doing something else, uh, but you're also involved in the open source community, uh, the Fire HOL as well. I mean, I thought, in, if you if you live in Greece, you're supposed to take like four hour lunches and just be on the beach. But but you're you know creating all these kinds of things. How, how do you find time for that? So I think that we all have uh, all we all have time. It's a matter of preference. Huh? At the same time, I, I I think that you know you see I am 50 years old. So um, how do you how can I be uh, involved uh, more technically involved with stuff? Uh, when my whole career is uh, a C-level executive. It's very hard. So I do it at home. Instead of watching TV, instead of uh, watching sports, etc., I enjoy playing with technology. I enjoy creating tools, playing with tools, uh, understanding technology in depth. Uh, this, this keeps me involved, let's say, alive. <laughs> I like it. That makes sense. It's a, it's a labor of love. Well, I definitely want to hear a little bit more about uh, what originally got you uh, to start NetData. So uh, let's go ahead and jump into our next segment, which is a new one here, our Worst IT Nightmares. Worst IT Nightmares. All right, so Costa, you said back, uh, back when you were working on another project, you had limited or, or no visibility into the network. So why don't, why don't you take us back there and, and uh, give us the scoop on that? Yeah. So in 2014, I was working on a FinTech company here in Greece, uh, and uh, we were migrating some infrastructure from, from on-prem to the cloud. Uh, the, the software was ready, so we were just moving the applications, right, the infrastructure. Uh, but we had problems, we had severe problems. So although at the operational level, so system monitoring and exception handling and all this kind of stuff were reporting zero issues, the business metrics were reporting significant loss in transactions, 80% less or 90% less than, than the expected one. So 
what, what we tried, you know, this is, this is a very difficult problem to cope with huh? because you don't have any visibility. Your monitoring tools do, do not say anything. Uh, the, the logs and the, the, whatever information you have is, is useless, nothing there, no exceptions at all. But still, you, have, uh, you don't have a business. It does not work. Um, so uh, what I did during this time is that, uh, uh, of course, I involved the hosting provider. Then the hosting provider was very keen to help because we were the biggest customer in this area. Uh, so they provided a lot of uh, experts that were reviewed, that were reviewing our applications and make, uh, su making suggestions to improve error handling, etc. Uh, of course, none of this worked. Uh, so after some time, I, I started. Uh, we started evaluating more monitoring solutions. So hoping that some solution, another solution, commercial or something, will be able to detect the issues we had. Uh, so. We had at some point, if I recall correctly, more than 80 monitoring, sorry, eight monitoring agents on every VM, eight. Uh, eight monitoring solutions monitoring every VM in parallel. So uh, still zero visibility, nothing. So after, after having spent uh, quite some money on monitoring, having built a, a team of five or six people, and having utilized uh, more than 10 consultants and uh, third parties to help us with uh, configuring all the stuff, uh, you know, building dashboards, building alarms, uh, uh, configuring every setting up everything for monitoring the infrastructure. And after several months, six or seven months, uh, I had concluded that all the monitoring solutions that, that exist is there to just make us feel happy. Uh, it's they don't they don't hey, actually monitor everybody loves anything. a green light you <laughs> yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah yeah it was it, so I, I think i thought that the principles of monitoring are wrong so what all these monitoring solutions do even today most of the monitoring solutions what they do is that they they try to fetch to get as little information as possible so they get a, for example 100 metrics every 10 seconds uh, and using this information, they uh, try to provide you a, a, an airplane view of your infrastructure, uh, while at the same time, at the same time, trying to detect as many failures or errors or uh, uh, problematic conditions as possible. Uh, I had concluded by that time that all this approach is completely wrong. So instead of going up higher and higher in monitoring, we need to zoom in to dive into. Uh, the problems. And this is how I built my data. So my data is like a magnifier. Instead of going abstract, it zooms in <laughs> to the infrastructure. Uh, and I think that this is why people loved it. Eh? They loved it because it does this in a, in a, in a very efficient way. Uh, so the moment it's in the data, let's say it's, it, it's an opinionated monitoring solution. Of course, you can customize it. But uh, uh, when you install it immediately after installation, you have a fully usable monitoring solution, fully interactive, a lot more interactive than anything else, uh, uh, visualizing all the information it collects. Uh, and it really collects hundreds of times more information than any other tool. I think that this made the difference within the data. And this, of course, helped uh, identify the issue. So the issues we had with uh, the nightmare was that the hosting provider uh, the, uh, was maintaining the, the underlying, the hypervisors, the underlying uh, software, the operating system. And during this uh, maintenance, they, will, uh, they were introducing hundreds of uh, small freezes, two, three, four seconds of freezes all, uh, all over the infrastructure, randomly throughout the several days. So this killed actually the, the service without any alarms. Of course, within the data, this was visible. That, that was, so we had uh, uh, gaps at the charts. You know, so I, per second. I, I've been a little quiet while you're telling this story, but you know, just to, so everybody knows, uh, while he was talking, I actually installed net data on one of my Linux servers that I run out of my house. <laughs> and you know, you, they've got a one-liner posted on the website, so you drop it in there. And I had to open up a port on the firewall, port uh, 19999. Uh, and once that was open, 
I was able to browse in and start seeing data right away. And so, you know, it, it'll build data over time, sure, but right off the bat, I'm able to mm -hmm. see information about my server and, and get that visibility. So it took me running one command to have that, or I guess two with the firewall rule, uh, <laughs> to get that in place. And I get instant visibility. And this makes me think of tools like um, SolarWinds Network Performance Monitor, where you can actually get a lot of visibility in there, but it costs you thousands upon thousands of dollars and you have to stand up a server. This is running entirely from the monitored nodes. It's really impressive stuff. So I'm, I'm curious, uh, actually, I'm gonna ask something that's really not so much technology related, but uh, I'm always curious when people create software. So like you created net data from scratch, you built this up. At some point you had to pick that TCP port number. How did you pick 19999? <laughs> uh, I don't know. It was. It was. I, I tried to find something that is not occupied, and I thought that uh, this num this port is uh, quite safe. <laughs> I, see, I thought he was so. going to say something about a Prince song partying <laughs> like it's nineteen ninety nine. Big fan. Yeah. Big Prince fan. <laughs> Well, uh, so so let's jump into our next segment here with Current Venture. So normally we'll talk about, uh, you know, what you've got going on, product launches or speaking events. And I, I know things are a little weird right now. So maybe we can use this time to kind of uh, get into a little bit of what, what Don was, was getting to there. You know, the fact that these other other solutions out here cost thousands of dollars and Don's able to just, you know, pick this up off GitHub here and, and run with it. So so how are you monetizing this? How is this, uh, how is this a business and not a passion project, basically? Yeah. So... The idea with the data, it, is, it, it, it started long before I, decide, I decided to, to, to do a business with it. Eh? So uh, the first thing it had is uh, market acceptance. So I knew that the data is a tool that people accept, people love, people need. Eh? So that was the first thing. Then, okay, you have this open source agent that is the best single node monitoring out there. It is the best among any other, solu any other solution, even commercial, open source, whatever. Um, how, and I love open source. As I said before, I am really an open source fan. Right? So how, to, how do you monetize it? How can you make a business out of it? And at the same time, promote the openness, eh? allow people to, to get to sp spread the technology all over the world. Eh? So I decided that, okay, we have this uh, agent. This is the open source agent. It is free and will always be free. Uh, it's a gift to the world. We still maintain it. We always make it better. Uh, and I, we have a team of about seven engineers working full time in it. So we pay for it. Uh, but no Marian revolves. This is a gift. Then what we do is that we build a, a SaaS offering that uh, connects to all your data, if you want, of course, it's, not, it's an option of yours, huh? uh, if you want. And we are trying to move all the principles of uh, the, the open source agent to the ho to whole infrastructure. So while the agent is single node monitoring, we are trying to do the same, zero configuration, uh, meaningful presentation, immediate results, everything the, the agent provides, we are trying to do it for the whole infrastructure, for the infrastructure as a whole. So to see, to explore your clusters, your Kubernetes setups, your whatever, whatever you have. Um, so this is a SaaS offering, but yet, the, again, we decided to offer this for free. So this is not open source, this is closed source, but it's again free. What we're trying to, to, to do now, we are trying to make, to, to provide a very uh, good, infrastructure monitoring service to everyone and we need the feedbacks this is why we give it for free we need people to help us make this the best to pro to, to to surface all the use cases to report back issues to 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 even contribute with their expertise uh, to make this even better so once we achieve this once we have a very good uh, SaaS offering that is free, uh, the free plan, then we will be able to to do it, uh, to, to, pro to provide paid services on top of it. So whatever we offer for free is and will always remain free, will always be free. What we are going to monetize is uh, services on top of it. We offer, a, we follow a, a, a go-to-market strategy that is, that is very similar to GitHub. 
uh, Slack and Cloudflare. So let's, let's take GitHub, for example. GitHub is a version control system, but can you buy version control from them? No, you can't. What you buy is a door, a security feature to the free uh, version control. Similarly, Slack. Slack is a collaboration engine, a chat engine, but can you buy chat from them? No. What you can buy from chat is increased retention, eh? so to have access to more than 10,000 messages in the past. And the same for, for Cloudflare. Cloudflare is a CDN. You can't buy CDN from them. What you buy is enterprise plugins on top of the free CDN. So NetData is a monitoring solution, but we will never sell monitoring. We will give monitoring for free to anyone in the world, everyone in the world. Uh, and we want this to be amazing, to be the best monitoring they experience. They have experienced so far. Uh, they want, we want it to be a, a, a rapid, immediate results, to be very helpful, right? to be open mind, uh, to be open mind, uh, sorry, uh, mind opening for, for uh, most of the engineers in the SREs, etc. Uh, what we plan to, to eventually make money from is uh, enterprise plugins on top of the free monitoring, uh, increased retention, and security, advanced security features that enterprises need. See, I, I assumed you were making money from selling Don's data uh, to Cambridge <laughs> no, no, Analytica, no, 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 so no, you're not. No, no, so that's no, great. Crypto mining. No, 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 yeah. no, no. And I, we're say, not selling data. <laughs> yeah, if you're, you're working actually, crazy, actually, go ahead. you know, we don't we don't even centralize data in order to avoid, especially this fear. What we have decided is that in the data cloud, the SaaS offering, will not centralize any data at all. We only centralize metadata. So I, I was going to make that comment because, uh, again, while you were talking, I, I took my server home and I added it to the uh, uh, to the, the cloud net data. And once I did that, you, know, you you create a war room, so you you're able to add your servers and group them together and so mm -hmm. on. I, I've got one in there right now, so it's not spectacular. <laughs> but I noticed that when I was browsing into a server, that I was seeing the local URL, so it was still coming down to that server to get the data. So really, really cool stuff. And I think you know, for our, our listeners out there, if you are someone who uses WhatsApp, uh, WhatsApp Gold. Uh, Solar Winds, any of the, the number of monitoring platforms that are out there, or even some of the built-in ones like Cockpit that uh, uh, Red Hat and Ubuntu have been pushing really hard lately, or Webmin. Uh, this tool provides all that functionality. It's really amazing, and it was super easy to get up and running. It's really, really cool stuff. And uh, if you if you want to check it out, it looks like netdata.cloud um, is where you go, and, and I assume that's got a, a link to uh, to the GitHub repository and all that on there, right? Yes, of course. Okay, perfect. Yes, yes, of course, of course. Awesome. Netdata.cloud. Well, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to to walk us through this, and I know you know that that means a lot to you coming from Don because he doesn't normally kind of give that. Uh, <laughs> you know, that, I mean, that's the, the product pitch there a little bit, but Don is, uh, Don's all in with it. So, uh, so that's great to hear, but thank you for taking the time to walk us through, um, where this came from and, and let us know about where it's going. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Yep. You too. And stay tuned, everybody. We've got more TechNATO coming up right after this quick break. This is Josh. Josh spent $2,500 on a week of classroom training for CompTIA A+, and got certified. Josh got a good job that pays $40,000 per year. This is Jeremy. Jeremy only spent $299 on a full year of training from IT Pro TV, including A+, and 300 other courses. Jeremy also got a great job that pays $40,000 per year. Jeremy used the more than $2,200 he saved in IT training for a fabulous tropical vacation. Now Jeremy is still using his IT Pro TV membership to study for Network Plus and Security Plus to advance his career, but not spending any more money. Since all three are included in his IT Pro TV membership, plus 300 more courses. Don't be like Josh. Choose IT Pro TV for your IT training. All right, welcome back to TechNATO with Don Pazet. Thank you so much to Costa for joining us all the way from Greece there. That uh, that was a really cool product. And uh, yeah, we were talking there in the break that something that could save us a lot of money. So what, what do you got, Justin? When, sorry, for some reason in my brain, all I see is Peter look over like you were 
like looking at a map going, where was that country again? Oh, yeah, Greece. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's Greece. That's a Denny's place map. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I love coloring. Not to scale. Yeah. That's over there uh, by, by I mean, the Italy. Don't get me wrong, Peter. I mean, I went to a, a United States public school as mm -hmm. well. I know nothing about geography. But. Sure. Yeah, it's uh, east of Virginia. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's where they are. What's east? <laughs> is that this? Is that left? Yeah, I think it's, it, yeah, sometimes. Sometimes it is. All right, well, we have a lot of news to get into, and as I mentioned earlier, we've, uh, it's, it's just a, a lot of news about waste. Um, so, uh, <laughs> a lot of data forms. wasted, but this first one. Human yeah, waste. Yeah, human waste. Could we have that human article, waste. too? Yeah, I guess we do. Uh, the first article is from TechCrunch.com. White House announces $1 billion investment for AI and quantum computing hubs. And I feel like if we used to, we used to play buzzword bingo all the time, quantum <laughs> is, is finally having its day where it, it was on that, sh that sheet for, for months and never got mentioned. And the last few episodes have been all about quantum, but um, is, is this a good investment, Don? My question is, why is machine learning also in this title? Why not? Yeah. Yeah, they, they could have grouped it in there. Yeah. Comma, <laughs> ML, comma, and quantum computing. In the cloud? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and social. Like, you could have yeah. worked social, social. Data somehow, too. Synergy. Influencer. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, this is one of those cases where quantum computing is right on the edge, right? There's still people who debate whether or not we truly have quantum computing or not. But obviously, there's a number of quantum services that are out there. We've interviewed several. Uh, AI is progressing, although if you ask your Echo to do something, it will still get it wrong most of the time. And if you ask Siri to do anything, it'll get it wrong almost all of the time. So AI is not where it needs to be. But I think this is really just the U.S. government reaching out and saying, we just don't want somebody else to be better at it than us. And so they are about to invest a billion dollars. They have zero plan, no plan for this money whatsoever, because that would be crazy talk. Uh, so it's just a billion dollars earmarked to be pissed away over the next year until the next budget year. But, so does that mean I can get a slice of that money? I yeah. think you can. Yeah. So yeah. I just go, listen, I added about six more if statements in this program I wrote. AI, baby. AI. It, it, if you just say that it in some way prevents our intellectual property from leaking to China, I think you can get all billion of all dollars. Money, yeah. Listen, if some, <laughs> if some rando dude with no money can purchase the New York Islanders, then by God, you can become. <laughs> all right, I missed a story here. Who owns the Islanders? Oh, there was this like Netflix documentary I watched about this guy who had no money. Yeah, he loved, he like, he was like a con man basically, and he grifted his way to purchasing the New York <laughs> Islanders. Um, well, but like he just was kept using AI to, and quantum computing yeah, to do it. Yeah. He just kept lying to people saying, oh, yeah, we'll transfer those funds. So go ahead and, you know, like send the, the property rights to me and we'll get that taken care of. And it's just like the, the natural like, right. so, uh, slowdown of, of movements of things like that. He was taking advantage of, and he ended up actually owning a team. But. This is a bunch of people who never encountered a grifter ever before, <laughs> because because I tell you what, everybody out there like, yeah, just go ahead. I'm like, no, there's no going ahead of nothing. I'm going to need to see that money, or I'm going to need to see something. He, he said it became a game to him ultimately, where he eventually was just like, I'm just going to start telling bigger and bigger lies and see what they'll believe. He and ended and up they with believed the Islanders. It all. I would be <laughs> well, in Gitmo. You know, speaking of sports teams, if you're ever in Seattle, the Seahawks Stadium has CenturyLink printed really oh. big on it, uh, and they... I, and it's out of order most of the time. I was <laughs> trying to work on some way to make this a grifter statement, but I totally failed at it, so never mind. Uh, but CenturyLink had a big failure this week. That was uh, our next headline, right, Peter? Yeah, let's go ahead and get over to that. Uh, this is from uh, Cloudflare's blog. Analysis of today's CenturyLink uh, slash level three outage. Because did CenturyLink buy level three? Is that what yeah. it was? Yeah. Okay. Yep, so uh, you might have noticed uh, in, over the weekend, uh, it was really, I think, mostly on Saturday that it all happened. Uh, there was a four-hour window of time where the whole internet seemed screwy. Things were slow, things were not loading, other things worked perfectly. Yeah, right? I, so, I went to the gas station, and I was trying to pay with the card, and the, the guy actually came outside and said, oh, all, the entire you know shell system is down. Yep. And I was like, oh, I should look and see if there's a story about this when it turns out it was this. And so what happened is CenturyLink had an outage. Now, that's not crazy, right? That, that happens. <laughs> yeah. ISPs have outages. <laughs> what was crazy here is that they had a four-hour outage. And you have to remember, whether you like them or not, uh, ISPs like CenturyLink and Comcast and, and other organizations have like the world's best network engineers on staff. Their network operations centers are world-class. So to have a four-hour outage is pretty impressive. 
uh, you know, for their entire infrastructure. Impressive. Yeah. And yeah, not the kind of impressive they're looking that for. you want. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. It was so, impressive how long he went without getting caught. Yeah. <laughs> so in this case, what happened was, you know, they had all these routes go down and normally BGP, the border gateway protocol would take care of that. People would route around it and that would be it. But even during the outage, CenturyLink was still sending out messages saying, no, we're good for this route, even though the route was bad. And so people were trying to publish new routes and they couldn't because CenturyLink was still claiming the routes as being valid that were now bad. Uh, and that dragged on for about four hours. Well, the people over at Cloudflare were affected. And Cloudflare, you know, they their big claim to fame is how they can resist any denial of service and they always stay online. They never get taken offline. So when this outage first happened, some people started blaming Cloudflare, but it wasn't them. And so they did an analysis to try and figure out what happened, an outsider's view. CenturyLink hasn't told us yet, but what Cloudflare found by looking at it was that it looks like something went wrong with FlowSpec rules inside of CenturyLink. And FlowSpec, if you haven't heard of it, is a really, really cool protocol, although Cloudflare hates it for some reason, but it is a cool protocol. They said they had an outage seven years ago due to a bad oh. FlowSpec rule. And then that was it. And now they were like, <laughs> we are done. We're done with you. That's right. Well, you know how when you configure a firewall, you create firewall rules, right? Well, imagine you had a thousand firewalls. You don't want to have to go and do that a thousand times. What FlowSpec lets you do is create a, a firewall rule for BGP, and then it passes along via BGP to all the other routers. It propagates through. And it looks like some bad rules went out that were so bad that it must have either, one, locked people out of the devices so the admins couldn't get in to fix it, or two, was blocking route updates so they couldn't just quickly push updates to it so they had to go and manually fix it on the devices so either way it's a bad scenario uh it all got taken care of it lasted about four hours but it's interesting to see problems like this that can affect a world-class network two things if they're locking themselves out of those devices through firewall rules i can work there because i've done that many <laughs> times <laughs> number two if you live in a rural area and you like back home CenturyLink is one of the like two internet providers yeah I, they're like Centur CenturyLink outage i was like like thursday or <laughs> the friday or any of the other times because yeah. in rural areas they eh, i know the isp level different but they're they're residential services yeah the, there's a an availability map on here that shows where the outage was hit and uh, I mean, Virginia is like completely red, and a lot of there's a lot of other little splotches. So, so it's like so, that state. So it's is funny. Just I think Virginia's red always. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Billy Ray, he got drunk and hit and poured beer on his DSL, <laughs> <laughs> and then he was sharing that with everybody because they're out on the Wi-Fi. He ran into oh. the backbone again. So I will uh, say, in, in a rural man. environment, you're probably used to losing internet connectivity. But like once you get into the city, we lost internet for a day a few months ago when our fiber got broken, and uh, my kids, they were going insane. Like they just they had not ex existed in a world without the internet. Did did Don just low key flex on us? Yeah. He was like, when our fiber went out, you yeah. know, yeah. unlike yeah. you, right. please. Yeah. <laughs> my backup T1 went out. <laughs> humble brag. There. That's funny. Is them uh, the people in the woods of uh, Virginia are like them big city folk. There's there fifteen hundred people in that town. It's huge. <laughs> <laughs> It's Six red relative. lights. I was like, man, that's crazy. <laughs> They're growing. We got to stop this urban sprawl. <laughs> well, this uh, this Cloudflare Cloudflare blog does a really good job of uh, getting into a lot of detail and and breaking it down. So if you're interested in that, definitely take a look over at blog.cloudflare.com. But let's move on now to our next article. This is from Office365ITPros.com. When a team's retention policy goes bad and data disappears. So uh, this is a story about, I think it was, yeah, it was KPMG that just lost, was like 145,000 people's uh, Private uh, chats. history of their chats, which yeah. that's a lot. Yeah, you know, in Office 365, you have data retention rules that you create, which a retention rule specifies how long you want to keep data for, right? But once that period of time ends, it also specifies what happens to it. You know, is the data destroyed or whatever? And a system admin for KPMG was modifying their retention rules. And basically what happened was uh, there was an employee or somebody who had left the company and they were looking to remove the chat messages for that user. But through a little slip in the user interface, they removed the chat history for all of their users. <laughs> and, um, 
Uh, and this this website, I had actually not been to Office 365 ITPros.com before, but uh, they have a little screenshot of how when you go to modify a retention rule, it defaults to all users, and you have to hit oh. choose and pick the user. So apparently they didn't do that. <laughs> Click save, and that rule wiped it out. And to add insult to injury, they reached out to Microsoft about if there was a way to recover that data. And Microsoft said, well, no, these are retention rules. You set it to destroy the data. We destroy the data. That's what we do. And so the data's gone, uh, and that's it. You know, a lot of people think once something's in the cloud, you've got this like perfect restore solution. But if you tell it to destroy it, it actually destroys it. Do you think there was like three employees that had said really inflammatory things on Teams and were like sweating it, and they're like, <laughs> "Woo, dodge the bullet!" There. It's like the end of Maybe. Office Space where the building burns down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. When, he, when all the evidence was in there. Yeah. Meanwhile, joke's on them because the NSA has a copy of all of that. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, the NSA is like, why are you calling Microsoft? We've, yeah, we've, we've got, got all that. that yeah. We'll yeah. go ahead and back it we'll up for you. Up. You want just these or yeah. all of them? <laughs> it's it's last 17 years. years. You want their personal chats, too, while they're at the house? Yeah. We'll just put that in there. You know, the U.S. government probably could put companies like Backblaze and stuff out of business and just say, we will now maintain the backup copies of all your yeah. data. We've <laughs> been doing it. <laughs> yeah. Now we're monetizing should, it. Should, do I have to, like, sign something? Oh, no, 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 no. It's, in, it's implicit. You signed it by being born. Yeah. <laughs> Ta-da, U.S. citizen. Where are you at? When? Where? How? <laughs> so this is obviously a, a big error by the, what I assume, former KPMG employee <laughs> now. But is this also, an, uh, I think it's an issue with the, the user experience on, on this uh, um, this screenshot here where it's it defaults to all. That's, also, yeah. there should be, I always feel like things like that that are super destructive, just put a confirmation in there. Like yeah. a little... Are you sure you want to delete all messages well, or with, blah, blah, with blah, like blah. details like this is what was, this yeah. is the effect yeah. it's going to have? Because there's the problem. The confirmation will normally be, "Are you sure you want to do this?" Yeah, but yeah, yeah I clicked the button, didn't I? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah I'm I'm I need to know the ramifications of the button click. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are you sure you want to lose your job today? Whoa, whoa, whoa! How was that? Yeah. Yeah. Back up, back up. Yeah, it should not be easier to delete all that data than it is to. I bet if we had more AI, then <laughs> yeah, it could have figured that it. out. Hey, uh, doesn't the um, doesn't the article go in to talk about that, like to automate these types of activities so that human error doesn't become a problem? But then there's weight against like, well, how often do you do this, and should you invest into creating yeah. an automation? Data retention policies are modified when laws are modified, so it's really infrequent, so it doesn't really make sense to automate it. Mm. You know? If only the machine could learn. <laughs> Unless it deletes 145,000 <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Knowing my luck, I would automate it wrong and delete all of it. Like, oh, man. Yeah. Man, I automated the piss out of that. It's all gone. <laughs> yeah. I could see that talk, you know, Billy walks into the office, listen, I'm sorry for deleting all that data. I'm going to automate this. It never happened again. And then, of course, we know his abilities. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I'm sure he came in with the good news of, just want to let you know, I freed up a lot of space uh, on the server. So. You save a ton of money on cloud you, to, you this You've got to start with the good news. Yeah. Right? yeah. He's like, also, I went ahead and packed my things up because uh, <laughs> yeah. I know how the second part of this conversation is yeah. going to get. All right. Uh, well, that's fun. Um, now let's let's move over to something that's a little more malicious and not just uh, user error. This one is from ArsTechnica.com. Russian tourists offered employee one million dollars to cripple Tesla with malware, and and when we originally pulled this headline up, it said undisclosed yeah. Nevada company, and now we know this to be Tesla. And sounds like a high rollers dare. Like uh, I dare you go to a <laughs> Tesla and install. You won't do it. So, <laughs> in addition to, I don't know if the noun tourist. Is the it's best. Right. Way That's to what I mean. This like, I just like see the guy with the camera around his neck and taking some shots. And by the way, <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, normally the lawyers eat this stuff up, and there's an active case going on. The FBI is involved, and so they don't disclose the company. Well, on Twitter, people were talking about this. You know, the highlight, the the headline was being highlighted and stuff. And Elon Musk himself responded to one of the tweets saying, much appreciated, this was a serious attack. And so that pretty much let the cat out of the bag. Oops. And I'm, I'm sure he's going to get in trouble for it because he's you know always doing tweets that he's not supposed to. And this is one of those examples. We had like uh, SEC violations well, too. This will be an SEC problem too. Because yeah, right. if your company's under attack, that can affect your valuation. He sold some stock and then tweeted, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, just keeps, he just keeps getting in trouble in that same like saying things that could affect valuation or stock prices. And he's like, I'll do whatever I want to. All he's right. price fixing. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> now, I, 
I can appreciate it though because like I I am a business owner, but I am not a businessman, and so I don't understand securities. I don't understand the stock market, and so I I could see me making these mistakes, uh, and that's why I try not to do public Anything. announcements like so, this. Uh, <laughs> so, Don, do you think you would do them multiple times though? Uh, it depends on whether I actually got penalized so, on any of those so times. So if you got burnt the first time, <laughs> SEC comes in, kicks in your door, and is like, we cut off your fiber optic internet. Also, you're going to get in trouble, whatever it may be. I don't think I would do it. I, like, I would just go, I'm off Twitter. I don't think I'm going to hang out over here. I so, think Elon's like, I'm still a billionaire. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm not a fair comparison. Yeah, he's I, a billionaire. He's, he's in the three comma club. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll just get in my spaceship then. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Whoa, I'll go. fly to space. <laughs> I'll go catch my car that is floating in space. There's no SEC on Mars. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Lo and behold, there's some dude with like a little... He's like, I can't wait till he gets here. He was hiding in the back seat of the Tesla. <laughs> He's going to be so disappointed. Uh, well, getting back to the story, <laughs> which we've created please, a whole yes. new story on. Uh, basically, a uh, you know a Russian visitor who somebody was just like, over here in country on also a known travel as a visa. Spy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, apparently worked for a malware group, uh, an unnamed malware group. And he was basically willing to pay this guy 500 grand to insert malware. The guy said he wouldn't do it uh, and actually talked him up to a million bucks. Uh, and then the guy contacted, well, the, the leadership at Tesla and then ultimately the FBI. They wired him so he could record the audio. But this uh, Russian operative, he, he was basically wine and dining the, the employee to try and get him to implant malware, basically take a USB key in and load this up on a machine. And the scary part about this, so this one failed, obviously, so that's good. Um, this guy got detained, but the scary part is the actual malware group is untouched. This was just an operative. You know, he basically worked on commission. Uh, the other thing is, in the recording, he states how they were able to hide the identity of the person who inserted the malware at multiple other companies, which means it failed here with Tesla, but it's been successful at several other organizations. And so it, it really highlights the threat of an insider attack. The, the, uh, this is one of those things at some previous positions. We had like a monthly bulletins, uh, quarterly training, and almost every one of them were like, if you see something, say something for insider attacks. Like, do you see someone going out to eat with people that they don't normally go out to eat with, uh, people like snooping around? So I suspect this is a more common occurrence than people would like to think, even if it's a Russian tourist or not. Yeah, you can, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, <laughs> uh, by a the way. A million dollars is a lot of money. <laughs> Peter's like, I will betray my country yeah. or uh, some other Justin says this is common. I, <laughs> I have not been called yet. But <laughs> I can't wait to be. Uh, I said it's more common than you may the think. The server room is right yeah. there, and so I Justin, know the code to yeah. the server room door. You know those guys then, Justin? <laughs> yeah. no, I'm still trying to get in on that ransomware thing. Oh, yeah, well, these guys should help you. What would you call them, a malware group? That sounds... I did have somebody ask me once, they said, uh, you know, Don, do you know how to write ransomware? Uh, and I said, well, anybody can make ransomware. It's not hard. And they said, well, why don't you do it? You can make so much money. And I said, <laughs> because, it's because wrong. there's this thing called jail. Have yeah. you forgotten like, how laws work? <laughs> I know how to punch you in the face I, and I, take your wallet. Too. I, I feel compelled because I joke about this. Just anybody listening. I'm joking. Like, that's morally wrong. Don't do this. Oh, was Justin the person in the example? Yeah. No, no, he was not. No. Uh, but, you know, for me, I always think about my skill set, right? I'm good at IT. I can configure firewalls and routers and servers. I don't think I'm good at the prison hierarchy. I don't think I can, you know. Those skills don't translate. <laughs> what would be weird if Don ends up in prison and goes, there's a lot of IT infrastructure. Yeah. <laughs> I could totally upgrade the commissary here. Use a... A contactless payment. Don't mess with that guy. He he makes the Wi-Fi work better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, our last article about uh, losing information comes from the Register.com. Engineer admits he wiped 456 Cisco WebEx VMs from AWS after leaving the business. Derailed 16,000 Teams accounts. Switched to his cloud infrastructure. Trashed. And his new employer doesn't want to fire him. Doesn't want to fire him. <laughs> oh, his new employer is the NSA. No. <laughs> like this guy. He's doing his great new employer work. is this place called Russian Tourism. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's definitely some mixed signals here. So, you know, the, the guy, I believe he's from India, uh, was here on an H-1B visa. So he was on a work visa, uh, was working for Cisco, left the company disgruntled. Five months later, he 
ran a, an automated script that he had that basically wiped out over 400 virtual machines that powered WebEx. And so Cisco ended up spending about $1.4 million in their investigation and legal fees. They had to spend another million dollars in refunding customer accounts for the outage, uh, you know, because it affected tons and tons of customers. Um, so all of that is, you know, the standard disgruntled employee story. The, the weird part is the fact that his current employer is still fighting for him to keep his visa so that he can stay over here and work. Uh, even though he did this. So that to me means one of two things. I, I'm all about two things today. Um, so one, either the owner of this new company is like a relative of his, <laughs> wants him to stay in, or two, this guy's really proven he's good at automation, right? <laughs> yes, <true>. I mean, <laughs> he was able to wipe out over 400 servers with Cisco watching. So uh, he's got some talent. And he faces up to five years in jail so I guess it's something where he can work from home. He's going to get that, uh, that RJ45 tattoo right here. <laughs> <laughs> is, is it the letters and numbers RJ45? Uh, I just the see port. the actual port. Yeah. Yeah. Like Maybe when, the connector. Yeah, yeah when the, it's filled the, in, is that when you've yeah. actually taken down a network? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think I understand how that works. So it doesn't say in, in any, any part in this article where he works now? Uh, they do not name the current employer, no. I wonder, uh, it would oh, be Elon Musk just tweeted. Uh, <laughs> APT28. Works, works here, glad to have him on board. It, okay. it seems, Team player. It seems, it would be interesting to see where he works, because, right, is it in a, is he really smart, or was this one of those things where, is it possible this could be a competing company? Let's check like, his LinkedIn here. Like <laughs> Let's check his LinkedIn. Sudhish Kasaba Ramesh. Oh, we're already connected. <laughs> First, wait a minute. He works here. Yeah. Uh, that would be embarrassing. Is he the new customer support guy? <laughs> Listen, I just click OK when people send me connection requests. <laughs> it's highly probable. All right, let's see where we got him. Uh, no results found. That's interesting. Yeah. You think even his history would be there? Well, I think NSA employees don't normally have LinkedIn profiles. Yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, and there's a there's a five year gap in his employment. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what he was up to at that point. But yeah. Well that that's that's interesting and I and I hope that we do find out more about this one because uh well first of all I'd like to see, you know, that that he is uh held accountable for it, but I'd, I'd love to see how this plays out with his new employer. That's a lot of fun. All right, well, we've got a couple of uh, great webinars coming up here very soon. There's one this week, Thursday, September 3rd. An inside look, the new Windows Virtual Desktop is here. Deploy WVD using the Azure portal, and that's with our own Mike Roderick and then Christian Brinkhoff, friend of uh, TechNATO, and uh, he's going to be joining us remotely for that one to uh, give us an inside look at Windows Virtual Desktop and the Azure portal. Uh, then we've got the buzz about intent-based networking. What you need to know about IBN is Thursday, September 17th, and that is with Mr. Ronnie Wong. Uh, you can check that out over at itpro.tv slash webinars. You can sign up for it, or if you've uh, happened to miss the time already, you can, um, you can see the archived version of that there as well, as well as all of the other archived versions of all the webinars that we have there so check that out and then uh, head over to go.itpro.tv slash technado uh, there you can get a coupon code for 30 percent off your it pro tv personal plan and that's for the lifetime of your account uh, you can also get a seven day free trial to, to check it out before uh, before you pull the trigger and you can request a demo for your team and learn about the volume discounts uh, for uh, teams with more than five seats and all that so that's over at go.itpro.tv slash technado all right, gentlemen. Well, uh, I think uh, I'll be waiting on the call from, from someone to um, install the malware, and it's good to know now that I can negotiate And in the interim. Uh, it's a good retirement plan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. I mean, jail's free for the person in jail, I guess. That, that's a good point, too. Yeah. You've Three got, hots and a cot. Like, I could go to <laughs> and, home. And think about it. Like, if you get 20 years in jail, you invest that million bucks appropriately. When you get out, you don't have to work. Ever. I feel like sometimes there's a fine involved or paying the... Nah. Didn't they say there was a fine? Nah, like he faced you, it said up to 250 grand. You slap that money into a bank that they can't touch and have it in a high yield. And something. all you got to do is like ask Apple or Google or something. They tell you where to put those cash reserves. You what know, you do is you tell them, listen, theory. after after like eight years, you say, listen, I'll give you all that money back if you let me out of jail. And you walk in there and you get just all the interest you've recruited. You give them their million bucks back, you're still sitting pretty. Yeah. 
How many I times mean, have you just slapped that mic today, it's, Daniel? Like it's it like owes you money. Somebody <laughs> put it right here instead of over here. So it's Mike's studio. You gotta address the elephant in the room. I yeah. think that's the problem. Is this is Mike's studio now? <laughs> All right. Fair enough. And he's about you know that tall. Well, that sounds like a good note to end on. But yep. uh, thanks everybody for joining us, and we'll see you next week right here on Technado with Don Pizzette.